This story of insulin is told you by two men whose experience and authority in this field is unique. On your right is Professor Charles Best, who of the late Sir Frederick Banting discovered insulin. In the center is Dr. R.D. Lawrence, himself one of the first to receive insulin and whose professional life since then has been devoted to the relief of diabetes. I am Dr. Liston, sitting on your left. <laughs> In fact, did you actually discover insulin? Well, it's a little difficult to fix an exact date. It was toward, toward the end of July, 26th or 27th of July, 1921, when we first saw the um, dramatic lowering of the blood sugar of a dog when we gave it a, an extract from pancreas that we thought was potent. That our lives, Fred Banting and I were, were waiting for this. We had uh, planned a direct attack. We prepared our diabetic dogs. They died without insulin, and we hoped to find insulin. And I think the end of July and August uh, marked the, the date of the first successful injections in Toronto. Dr. Lawrence, would you... Uh, well, Charlie, I've often wanted to know, I know there were two of you, Fred, afterwards Sir, Sir Frederick Banting, yes. and yourself. I wonder who realized first of the terrific discovery you'd made, and who spoke first about it, and what you said to each other. Well, I think he was leaning over my shoulder when I was doing the, the blood sugars. I did the chemistry, and he did the surgery. I suppose... Uh, well, I wouldn't like to say that I saw the lowering before he did, because he was there all the time. I'm sure he noticed the uh, clinical improvement in the dogs Yes. before I did. Let's say I saw the lowering of the blood sugar before he did, the chemical estimations, the results of them. And what did you say, or what, who spoke first? Can you remember any, anything that... Well, I imagine we turned to each other and said, I think we've got it. Yes. Uh, sort of simultaneously. What age were you at this stage? 27. And uh, you had been an active person playing hockey and... Playing record. everything, yes. Playing everything. Yeah. Just out of the First World War, yeah. that sort of stuff. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, when you found that even chemical pathology was too much for you, what did uh, you do then? Oh, I went home for a bit, but I couldn't bear the atmosphere of dying at home. Dying, sir. Well, I knew I was going to die. Everybody of that age with diabetes then died within four or five years, whatever they did. Yes. So I skipped. I wanted to make a little money, and I wanted to have a very quiet life, so I went to Italy and practiced in Florence as a general practitioner. In Florence? Yes. Were you an Italian speaking? Well, I was in a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, I mean, I practiced in yes. the English and Americans, after yes. all. Yes. It was that, I, that sort of practice I went for. And I did quite well when I could keep awake. When you could keep awake? Yes. yes, even when there was a new and rare patient, which wasn't very common. I was <laughs> asleep talking to them. Yes. And I used to fall downstairs and couldn't walk up. Thank God there was a lift in my, where I lived. Now, that was in 1921? That was 21, yes. 21. And uh, the doctor at my hospital wrote and said, I hear there's something for diabetes called insulin in, in Canada. Sounds good, and I said, well, I'm not paying any attention to it until you know more about it, and they say it's genuine. I've tried so many things that have turned out to be quackeries for diabetes that I'm not going to believe or hope for a thing. And, and then he cabled me and said, I've got insulin, it works, come home quick. So I did. I just bundled into a car and got a chauffeur, Italian fellow, who wanted to go to Soho and see his uncle. <laughs> and we got home together and I started insulin and in a day or two I knew I was going to be all right. So at the time that Dr. Banting and Bess discovered insulin, Dr. Lawrence, you were indeed a dying man. Yes, more than dying, desperate as well. And this yeah. moment arrived and you were cable for and you came back. Straight away, and yes. And you knew then that you I knew right. after the first dose, which made me clear of sugar for the first time for about six months, that it all was going to be well. And indeed, I gained four pounds in the first f four days of insulin. Dr. Lawrence, you really owe your life to Dr. Best, and yes. millions of others. Don't yes, you? very many millions, but I'm, to me, I'm the most important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're one of the most important, if not the most important. <laughs> Good, no, no. But has someone not said uh, something of that kind? Yes, Describe Dr. Johnson, who's sort of the doyen of diabetic specialists the world over, has called... Uh, 
our friend Robin Lawrence, the most famous living diabetic. And he did that because Robin has helped so many other diabetics in clinical ways and in helping the organization of societies here in England. And he was the first president of the International Federation of Diabetics. He really started that and put it on its feet and it's going to go, I think, now. The best. Uh, may I come back to you now? You have some more highlights, I'm sure, to tell us about. Well, Fred Banding and I had a wonderful time together in 1921. We were alone and everything we did was new. It's not very often you get that situation in research, but uh, that was true in 1921. We found that if we gave the dogs, uh, our diabetic dogs, too much insulin, they got low blood sugar. And if we gave them a little sugar, they felt better again. And we had in mind the use of insulin in patients and tried to anticipate uh, that by studying our, our dogs as carefully as we could. I think we um, showed the effect of uh, insulin on our diabetic dogs 75 times without any failures before the first patient was treated. Now that patient got his insulin on January the 11th, 1922. And Dr. Lawrence was in Florence. Well, that. yes, about that time. It was later. A little, I thought a little bit that. later. But uh, we ran out of insulin, too. Uh, lost a secret for a time. And some of our patients who had been treated and were well died from lack of insulin. That was a hectic time, particularly for me, because I was supposed to make it again. And, uh, of course, we did rediscover how to do it. And uh, the secret can never be be lost. No. Uh, well, I think the new insulins are very good for those who only need weak insulin action, and they have the enormous advantage of acting by one injection a day. And obviously, if you have a thing that will act a long time, it can't act terribly hard at any one moment. So when you get into severe diabetic states, I'm quite sure, Charlie, that back to your original one is what everybody does. Yes. For the routine living with insulin, a lot of these um, one, that one injection a day are very good indeed and very welcomed, of course, by the patients. But um, a good, strong, hard action in any troubles, approaching comas or infections, back to the good old stuff you made first of all, too pure is alert and it to be a good thing. <laughs> as long as it's aseptic, that. Yeah, we, we, we have to add back a pure impurity uh, now to make it uh, last a little, a little longer. And uh, Dr. Best, uh, any other highlights? Well, there must have been very many, but can you at the moment recall any particular? Well, I, uh, to I've got a... Caps on these ships coming over the... Yes, yeah, yes. Sir. One time uh, during the war, I shared a cabin with uh, Adrian and Dale, and uh, the ship's medical officer came to us one night and asked whether we knew any biochemistry. We asked him why, and he said there was an unconscious boy American boy down in the hold of the ship. Well, the boy had acetone on his breath. We thought he was in diabetic coma, but we had no insulin. And then we ran around the ship and found that the captain of the ship was a diabetic. So we borrowed some of his insulin and the boy recovered. And got along very well. You were sharing a cabin with Adrian and Dale. And, uh, and two, the, two of the greatest... Physiologists. Let's call them physiologists. Lord where? Adrian Sir Henry Dale, yes. Dr. Best, is there any indication whatsoever uh, that you will ever be able to prevent diabetes? Prevention is really our, our ultimate That's goal. Go. And uh, if we had an insulin to be given by mouth, I believe that the onset of diabetes could be postponed or prevented in, in certain types of cases. We've already done that in our animals by giving insulin prophylactically and preventing the onset of, of diabetes. But uh, if that, uh, it would facilitate it a great deal, I'm sure, if uh, insulin could be given by mouth. The, the clinicians don't like to make injections into children who are perhaps threatened with diabetes but don't actually have it. So that's never been thoroughly investigated as yet. I think the clinicians are right not to do that, but they certainly would if we had a preparation that could be given by mouth. So that your ultimate aim is prevention, and there are leads to indicate that someday perhaps that may be possible. I believe there are. I had an aunt who had diabetes. Uh, she was a nurse, 
And uh, she died in diabetic coma in 1918, three years before three years. insulin came along. So I had a, a family interest in, in diabetes. There's nothing like that for stimulating. No, for pushing you on. Yeah. Fred Banting uh, watched a, a classmate of his, a little girl of 14, die of diabetes. I think he was stimulated to select diabetes as his research by that happening, too. Yes, one of his first loves at school, I think. Yes, this girl that, uh, of course, the children went very quickly. I mean, more quickly than uh, no people child. of your age. Oh, yes, no child lived a year after diagnosis of diabetes no. before insulin. And today, these children... Well, they're growing up, marrying and reproducing, producing children of their own. One of the great disadvantages of insulin therapy is, of course, that you have to use syringes. What advances may we expect in insulin therapy in the foreseeable future? Well, when we were created, it was arranged that the insulin would be delivered into a vein. I've always wondered why it wasn't put in our food. But it's not a vitamin, it's, a, it's an internal secretion. And perhaps someday we can make a depot insulin that will be liberated from, say, under the skin in the same way that the insulin is from the, the gland in non-diabetic people. Of course, the, uh, you have in mind the oral yes. insulin. Yes. Personally, I think there are some leads that may make it possible someday to uh, have a preparation which can be given by mouth. I don't know uh, what the clinicians would think of that. Is that a very important thing, do you think, Robin? Uh, oh, I think it would be a great blessing to thousands of diabetics needing insulin if they could eat it or not have to inject it. You are all very clever, but I think that's going to be quite a problem, you suggest, to make a yes. depo insulin that will be sensitive to your own insulin requirements. But as I say, you've done more difficult things in the past. Go ahead and do it and then we'll eat your insulin, <laughs> so we'll, we'll eat your preparation and throw away our syringes, but we'll keep the syringes for I a long you, time. I think you better keep them for some time, yes. So that you'd regard uh, oral, the introduction of oral insulin as a tremendous advantage. I would indeed, that. yes. An unbelievable advance, almost. I say unbelievable, but I withdraw that word. It's a bit too strong, but not very much too strong, I think. No, but it's a, it's a great challenge, and that's the type yes. of thing. you get ahead with it. Yeah, well.